All right, we are back. It's been a couple weeks. I was in Miami for the Bitcoin conference. I was in Mexico for a good friend's wedding. But today we've got a lot to unpack. I am serving up your piping hot monthly Bitcoin digest. There is so much around the topic of innovation that we have to cover today. We're going to be talking about token issuance on Bitcoin. We're going to be talking about new scaling proposals and more. Let's jump in. All right, so as the first category that we'll talk about, we'll call it token issuance. And for those that have been following the channel, you know that I've covered things like ordinals or inscriptions, as well as the fungible token standard BRC20, which basically embeds JSON data as inscriptions onto the Bitcoin blockchain to create a fungible token standard. I would invite you to check out my last video where I go into that in all its gory detail. How did we get here? What is sort of the latest and greatest there? And while it is the case that the combined total market cap of these BRC20 tokens has fallen uh, quite significantly since that last video, I think in the last video it was just under $600 million in total market cap, which itself is insane. And as we can see here, that number has dropped quite a bit, uh, about 275 million, but still nothing to scoff at. So yes, some of that early hype might have been a little bit frenzied, but we are continuing to see some pretty interesting developments. We saw Stably come in and launch hashtag USD, the first BRC20 stablecoin on the Bitcoin network, which is pretty crazy. So Stably is a stablecoin as a service company, I guess that's a thing. They also have a fiat on an off ramp. And so they have just launched this stablecoin, which is backed one-to-one -one with USD. And so again, as we've talked about on the channel, you and I may have not as much interest in holding digital versions of uh, of fiat, but this really is in a big way an on-ramp for a lot of folks, particularly those in emerging markets who don't have easy access to dollars in a world that is still certainly dominated by them. Although that of course is changing with the whole de-dollarization story as well. You also saw this announcement where Ethereum NFTs are getting converted. So they're getting burnt and then transferred over as inscriptions onto the Bitcoin network through a standard called BRC721E. And so the Milady's, uh, I guess, NFT project was really the one that sort of kicked that off. And so my point in saying all that is that clearly there's still an abundance of activity around these different emerging token issuance methods on Bitcoin. Will they ultimately prove to be a fad? Obviously time will tell, but you also of course had RGB's big rollout. I covered that in a prior video as well that I would invite you to check out. And it should be noted that RGB does go well beyond token issuance and also brings general purpose smart contracts to Bitcoin. But there is a lot going on in RGB. And then as well, you have Taproot Assets, formerly known as Taro. Uh, there was a Monero Tari protocol that actually sued or pursued legal action against Lightning Labs because the name Taro was too similar to Tari. Uh, in any case, they've rebranded it to Taproot Assets. And so you had the latest release of the Tap D or the Taproot Asset Daemon, which allows for the creation of fungible tokens um, that can be moved on chain and that will ultimately be able to be moved through Taproot Lightning channels. So asset issuance on Bitcoin continues to be a really huge topic. It continues to drive above average fees for miners, although those have come down from, from some of the most congested moments that we saw in recent weeks and months. But it's really interesting stuff and it'll be very interesting to see which of these approaches really takes off and has longevity and traction. They all have different trade-offs. Things like ordinals and BRC20 tokens, which of course use ordinals to work, are interesting experiments, but are also very inefficient ways to create tokens on Bitcoin versus something like Taproot Assets, which is a lot more thoughtfully designed. In fact, you need only to go to the very first documentation page 
for BRC20 to read that its creators also agree Taproot Assets is an unambiguously better solution for this. So I do think while they've been early movers and fast movers, you will ultimately see something like Taproot Assets gain steam, especially when it comes to mainnet and is production ready over the coming months and into early next year, because it's also going to be highly compatible and interoperable with existing LND daemons and uh, related lightning infrastructure. So I think you're gonna see a huge wave of taproot asset adoption. And then also RGB has, has its own trade-offs. I think it adds a lot more complexity in the sense that you have to run an RGB node, you have to run additional infrastructure just to make all this stuff work, but it does offer an immense range of use cases. Again, not just token issuance, but also general purpose smart contracts where you can do all sorts of awesome things like create decentralized exchanges, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts in the comments. Which of these methods or approaches do you favor? Do you not favor? Do you think all of token issuance on Bitcoin is a stupid idea in general? Let me know your thoughts. I'd be interested to see what you wanna see covered more or less in future videos. But with that, let's move on to the next topic, which are new scaling proposals for Bitcoin. So I must say this really is the first time in the roughly four years that I've been like very, very immersed in Bitcoin where it has been a genuine struggle to keep up with everything that's happening, which is awesome to see. So for all the doomsayers that say, oh, you know, Bitcoin is my space and all this nonsense. I mean, it is just emphatically and unambiguously uh, not the case as evidenced by what we're all talking about. And I saw a very thought provoking post. I'll throw it up in editing if I can find it. But it it was something to the effect of, for certain use cases, we've looked at things like Ethereum as sort of the test net to Bitcoin, right? Go and try out all these kind of experiments and bring back the things that actually add value, whether it's privacy enhancing technology, maybe roll-ups to help with things like scalability, right? There are interesting ideas out there that will trickle over to Bitcoin if they add enough value and if they make enough sense and if they can be integrated in a way that preserves the base protocol of Bitcoin and disturbs it the least amount possible. But this post also sort of postulated, well, what if Lightning is actually the test net for yet new scalability proposals? And I'm not so sure that's the case. We have to remember a few things. The proposals I'm about to go through are very, very new. There are not working implementations of this. So all of this stuff is going to take a long, long time to unfold. But I do think it's very interesting and constructive in the community to see competition, right? We To see this marketplace of ideas where developers, community members, educators can discuss these different solutions to very real problems, which is how do we scale Bitcoin? How do we enable all 8 billion people on this planet to be able to use Bitcoin in a truly self-sovereign way? And so today we're going to talk about two proposals. One is ARC, and this was introduced and announced by Barack at the Bitcoin conference just a couple weeks ago. What was previously known as TBDXXX has now been officially named ARC. Barack, by the way, was known for finding a couple lightning bugs that were pretty big deals. Uh, they were resolved relatively quickly. Uh, again, even the Lightning Network is still in its quite early days. But I would encourage you to listen to his talk from the open source stage in Bitcoin Miami. He highlights a number of challenges that are certainly not secrets, right? When it comes to the Lightning Network, one of the really big usability challenges is the idea of inbound liquidity. So if I want to use the Lightning Network non-custodially or in a fully self-sovereign way, where I'm not trusting someone else with my funds, I have to be running my own Lightning node and I therefore have to be managing my own channel liquidity. And so in order to receive funds for someone to send a payment to me, I have to have what's called inbound liquidity. If any of these terms are new to you, I have a whole playlist on the Lightning Network, how it works, how to run a node, why you might want to run a node, how to build a node from scratch, all that good stuff. So I would encourage you and invite you to check that out. But that's a really big challenge. And we can see that reflected in the following where we've really seen non-custodial lightning usage sort of level off 
whereas all the growth has really been driven by custodial usage. This is looking at data from Amboss. And you've certainly had certain wallets like Breeze come up with clever ways to get around that. So when you download a wallet like Breeze on your mobile phone, for example, you're using a lightweight Neutrino Bitcoin node right there on your phone, and then you're using what are called turbo channels. So the first payment that's coming into your Breeze wallet, Breeze will open using their LSP or Lightning Service Provider, they will open a channel with you to allow you to receive that transaction immediately or what appears to be immediately. So there's some different tricks out there that do ease this problem, but there are others as well, right? This problem of synchronization, the idea that, hey, for me to send a payment to you, the receiver has to always be online in order to receive that payment. That's very different from on-chain where you just give me your address and I can send that to you. Now, there are things called PTLCs that can potentially help with that, but again, this is going to be a work in progress. Furthermore, because Lightning is fundamentally a network of payment channels, you have these on-chain transactions that are required to open those channels between peers. And so the math has been done that if you wanted to do this for all 8 billion people in the world, it would take you a very, very, very long time. And that is because of Bitcoin's scarce block space, right? In order to get all these individuals with, you know, maybe a couple channels opened, it's going to take a very, very, very long time. Now, again, there are things like channel factories that promise to help address this. Barack is basically trying to say, well, like, is there a way we can kind of move the needle in the shorter term? And so what started as work on a new Lightning wallet, TBD XXX, has really become a new category of L2 or layer two on Bitcoin. So this is not a state chain. This is not a roll up. This is a new category of scaling. And the way Barack describes it is basically a Xiaomian eCash meets trustless hub and spoke model, right? Because with traditional Xiaomi and eCash mints, you do have a degree of trust in the minter or in the entity that's doing the minting for the network. And so in the case of this hub and spoke model with ARC, you have what are called ASPs or ARC service providers, which perform two really big roles. On the one hand, they are basically serving as blinded coin join coordinators. We'll talk about that. And then on the other hand, they are providing liquidity to the network. So they're the liquidity provider, similar to an LSP or lightning service provider in the world of the lightning network. But then they're also conducting these blinded coin join rounds. And in exchange for these services, they will earn a fee. So let's break this down a bit. Every five seconds, ASPs are conducting these coin join rounds. If you're not familiar with CoinJoin, I've covered those in prior videos. But the analogy is imagine I'm out in the street and you look out your window and you see me standing there in the street. I'm pretty easy to spot. But what if it was the case that I had a whole crowd surrounding me? And what if furthermore, it was the case that all of us were sort of dressed in the same attire, we had the same uh, kind of mask on, it would be really, really, really difficult to spot me out in the crowd. And so that's effectively what's happening. You are surrounding yourself with a crowd such that it becomes impossible to connect with certainty the inputs into this transaction with the outputs or where these different outputs are heading. So if I'm a user in ARC and I wanna send a payment to someone, that payment goes into these five second cycle coin join rounds and gets sent to the destination. And the coordinator in this case, the ASP, is blinded to these inputs and outputs. So they don't know who the sender is, they don't know who the receiver is. So you break this sort of linkage between the two and that confers really, really strong privacy guarantees. It's also the case that critically, there's no liquidity constraints, right? The ASP's job is to provide liquidity to the system. And we'll break down how that happens in just a moment. But what this means is that the onboarding for someone to use this is a lot easier than if you were to have to spin up your own lightning node, build out all this channel capacity, et cetera, et cetera. And lastly, from a scalability standpoint, the great news is that this has a very, very, very tiny on-chain footprint. So basically what happens is any number of these transactions can kind of 
go into this coin join round and then you more or less only have one transaction that actually gets put on chain. And again, this is conceptually similar to some of how Taproot Assets works and some of these other methods that we talked about earlier in terms of asset issuance. But one of the core concepts behind how all of this happens is what's called a virtual UTXO or a VTXO. And so ARC has its own UTXO set that lives off chain. These are the VTXOs. And you could get one of these things in one of two ways. You can do a process called lifting a normal on-chain UTXO into a VTXO, which is off-chain. And so this would be somewhat akin to like a peg-in process to a sidechain. So you're lifting this UTXO into this off-chain protocol that is ARC, or you could just receive a VTXO from another user, right? So to get into the ARC system, you have this lifting process. Once you're in the ARC system, these VTXOs can be sent and transferred very quickly. And then what's really nice is you also have a unilateral way to exit the system back to on-chain. So in a way, this is like a trustless two-way peg, which really has been one of the holy grails for quite some time, especially when you think about side chains like the Liquid Network or others that use a more federated model to process those pegouts from this alternative layer or network. And so what's happening here is you have this concept of a shared UTXO. And this shared UTXO has these two critical properties. Anyone can reveal the nested VTXOs from that shared UTXO within four weeks. This is just, a, it's an arbitrary sort of uh, timing. And then the service provider or the ASP can actually sweep the shared UTXO after four weeks. What this means is that users need to essentially spend the VTXOs or they can do something called self-spend. They can just send the VTXO to themselves. So this is not like a, you know, China CBDC sort of requirement that you have to spend money in a certain amount of time. This is to help keep the system lively. And what's also really nice is these different VTXOs can actually be used to pay lightning invoices. Basically the ASP can just attach a hash time lock contract, which is the fundamental way that the lightning network works. And you can use these VTXOs to pay lightning invoices. So in a way, as Barack describes it, ARC is somewhat like a subnet of lightning. And so if you take away nothing else, you've got this sort of one-to-one -one mapping of UTXOs to VTXOs via this shared UTXO concept. You can have all this activity with the VTXOs that's all happening off chain, right? You can have tons and tons of users sending all these little VTXO payments to each other. Then ultimately all of that gets rolled up into this on-chain pool transaction where you have just one input and one output. And that is what makes this incredibly efficient and scalable. And so within that single on-chain pool transaction, you have these new VTXOs that get created. And then again, every five seconds, you have one of those pool transactions where the old VTXOs get purged and erased and new ones get created. So Barack had put together this little comparison, which again, you know, is going to be biased towards ARC, but there's this idea of non-interactivity, meaning I can just send someone a payment. I don't need them to be uh, interacting on the network. I don't need them to be sort of always connected and always on. And so as of now, without some sort of covenant functionality, such as CTV or check time lock verify, right? That's codified in BIP 119. Without that, you would still have that challenge and issue with ARC, but you could still implement it. Uh, there has been renewed discussion of BIP 119. I did a whole video on that. If you'd like to check that out, this was uh, fiercely debated over the last sort of year or two. But if you were to have that, if you were to have covenants, then you could have interactivity with ARC, which would be a big differentiator. Uh, ARC's claiming that its onboarding is much easier in the sense that you don't have to worry about liquidity. That's the ASP's uh, sort of job. But you're also not trusting the ASP given that they are blinded to these coin join rounds that are happening. They're marking themselves as a double check with scalability because you have a smaller on-chain footprint, arguably, than, than Lightning does. 
Uh, and in terms of privacy, again, you get those great assurances with the coin join rounds that are happening. Now, there are some caveats to that. The way that this sort of four week timeline works where the ASP gets to sweep up these VTXOs that haven't been moved, that is interesting. And I think wallets will have to sort of manage that on behalf of users. They can't be expected to sort of remember to move things or pay themselves uh, back and things like this. And it should be noted that the, this is a big ask for ASPs. Like ASPs really have to be very competent uh, kind of operators. They have to have a lot of on-chain liquidity. So again, I'm gonna leave ARC here for today. I probably will do an even more sort of gory in-depth version in a future video. Maybe once we have some sort of implementation that's being built or, or having been built. But for now, I think the punchline is that this is a very interesting new scalability category that combines a lot of the great privacy traits we get with things like CoinJoin transactions with huge scalability potential via this hub and spoke model that gets away from the typical liquidity requirements of the Lightning Network. Now again, a lot remains to be seen, right? This is all essentially theory at this point. There is no kind of implementation or, or code that people can kind of test out. So it'll be very, very interesting to see. And then that gets us to our final topic, which is around Enigma. And as it is rightly named, this is a little bit of a tougher one to grok. Again, I'm going to stay very, very high level in these next few minutes with the idea of doing an, a more in-depth video down the line. But this is something that was proposed by a user, PolyD. Part of this goes back to BIP 119 or CTV check template verify, which introduces covenants or the ability to impose conditions on future Bitcoin transactions. Now, there's a lot of valid skepticism and concern about what that could open up, right? Could a nation state or, uh, you know, bad actor of some kind impose upon, for example, exchanges that, hey, you can only withdraw your Bitcoin under these circumstances and they can only be sent to, you know, these addresses, right? I think there are some very real concerns there, but at the same time, covenants would also open up quite a lot of additional flexibility. So again, check out my prior video where I go through that in more detail. But the big idea of what this would enable is we had Taproot, which allowed signature aggregation, and what Covenants and you know the Enigma network would really operate on is the idea of transaction aggregation. So the Enigma network would in a way act as a layer even between layer ones and layer twos. And those layer twos could include the Lightning Network. They could include ARC. So it's this more generalized settlement layer which enables the bundling of transactions. Different users can form different bundles. And so whatever the action might be, whether it's opening a lightning channel, closing a channel, creating a multi-sig vault, all of this can sort of be bundled together in these sort of off-chain settlement UTXOs, as we might call them, very similar to the VTXO concept we just discussed with ARC. And what you would have are what are called anchor UTXOs, which go on chain. And so one way that PolyD has described this is that Enigma could sort of sit over all of this and ARC could be a component of this. And so in a similar way as to how in ARC, the ASPs are using anchors, in Enigma, all users are using these anchors. And so this is a bit of a paradigm shift, right? A lot of us have thought, well, we'll just sort of live on layer two in a high fee environment and all will be good. But what Enigma is really saying is, well, there could be all sorts of layer twos. And so we need a way to kind of efficiently interface with all of them and allow any user to benefit from this idea of these anchor transactions in which many other actions can be bundled is sort of the big picture idea. So I'm gonna leave all that here for today. I will put some resources in the description down below for those of you that wanna take a deeper look at any of this. They are fascinating and really thought provoking ideas. I have certainly just skated on the surface, hopefully doing a bit of justice to these ideas in terms of the high level concepts. But even then, you know, it takes a couple passes to really grok some of what's being proposed here. Now, as Giacomo correctly points out, these proposals do borrow concepts and ideas from prior proposals, right? And he lists out a number of them here. And indeed, Barack even 
sort of admits that, right? That, you know, ARC is kind of a clever packaging of multiple prior ideas. So we should certainly acknowledge that. But my big conclusions here are a few fold. One, look at what a little bit of fee pressure has brought forth in terms of either the resurfacing, novel repackaging of some of what has been discussed in the past to really advance these conversations. So the market works, right? A problem arises and solutions start to get proposed. That is extremely encouraging to see. The second big conclusion I reach here is that perhaps lightning isn't the end all be all L2. And I've thought that for some time and I think a lot of folks would agree. Don't get me wrong, I love lightning. I think lightning is so enormously transformational. Few of us can uh, even wrap our heads around it. And indeed I'm putting skin in that game via uh, you know, our startup jolts, right? This is, we're fundamentally doing lightning rewards uh, as a service. And so lightning is going to continue its rapid growth, but perhaps there will be other L2s and perhaps there will be some sort of interface settlement layer between the base layer and these different L2s such as Enigma. I think that would be an exciting world to see because as we discussed earlier, there are limitations in terms of lightning. And so the more solutions to scale Bitcoin and bring more individuals onto the network, the better. But with all of that, let's go ahead and conclude today's video. All right, so today was pretty action packed. We went through a recap of some of the different token issuance methods that we've seen pop up on Bitcoin, whether it's RGB or Taproot Assets, Ordinals and Inscriptions or BRC20. It is pretty dizzying all the different things that are happening there. Now, I know a lot of skeptics may say, well, why do we need these you know, tokens on Bitcoin? But there are a number of really interesting things that are getting built. Again, things like stable coins really are an important onboarding mechanism to get people onto the Bitcoin network in the first place. And then perhaps arguably more interestingly, we took a look at some of the new scaling proposals, ARC and Enigma. We went into some of the core concepts hopefully demystified them a little bit. But again, I will definitely be doing some future videos where we go more in depth. And again, I'll provide some resources in the description if you wanna take a look for the meantime. But I'm curious to hear, what are your thoughts? What do you think of all of this different uh, swirling activity? What would you like to see more of? What would you like to see less of? Let me know in the comments down below. But I hope you found this valuable and insightful. If you did, you already know what to do. Give this video a like. Use the share feature underneath this video that really does help get this to a broader audience. And regardless of where you sit in terms of the learning curve, I think it's important at least to be familiar with some of this stuff at a high level because there really is this kind of social consensus around Bitcoin that is the ultimate, ultimate last level of defense, right? And so to be a more informed citizen of Bitcoin, I think it's important to at least have a high level understanding of some of these moving pieces and if you were so enamored with this content, you want to donate to a pleb, which really does help me continue to make these videos, you can do so in a number of ways. There's the YouTube super thanks feature built right in here. If you're using something like the Get Albi browser extension, you can just click that bad boy and send some sats that way. Or I will have my strike account and lightning address on the final page momentarily. For now, we'll go ahead and leave things here. As a reminder, every sat counts. And until next time, I'll see you then. Yeah.